I am the War Chief. Hello, my friends, and welcome. We are in session once again for a bit of a special video. In fact, this is the first video of its kind on our channel, and this is going to be a, a, th a breakdown of the 3D project that I created for Sana. It was for her graduation. No? Now, I'd, I'm just going to very quickly go over the process of how I create a 3D environment. Here we go. There. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a process, but I'm going to go over each of these steps just in passing. And um, if there's any part of it that you would like to discuss with me more in depth, I would be more than happy to talk to you on the Discord. But for this, for the sake of for the sake of this video and for the uh, purposes of time, I won't go into too much depth. Now, when you're first starting a project, you always have to come up with a concept first. Um, what do you want to do? How are you going to do it? What are some references that you can take from it? Numbers one and two, creating a concept and references, those usually go hand in hand. Sometimes you look at some references and then you get inspired to create a concept or you already have an idea for a concept, but you're looking for supporting references to build that further. Now, um, I'm going to go over these th the other steps later on, but for now, let me show you an example of what I mean. Here we go. Just follow me. Okay, we're not usually in this kind of a setup, one of the rare times that we are. <laughs> so this one is just a page that I took from my top secret notebook. Because <laughs> sometimes when you're creating a um, a concept it is so much easier to just draw it out and then figure it out uh, while it's so easy to jot things down on paper i just wrote all these down very messily it was just a very quick sketch like i wanted to create this this big floating dome with some spotlights some maybe floating rays something like that um and then idle stage on here with the big metal ring all those things now how i came up with this concept was uh, let's keep that list here again see creating a concept and references now for references i was looking mostly at the other idle stages in certain 3d lives for example in okayu's recent one this is the idle stage that a lot of them use as you can see there's all if you break down the shapes they're all very basic they're all uh rectangles rectangles triangles rectangles and you know the circles here the spotlights and if you look closely they're actually hexagonal in nature to make it uh make it uh lighter on the load of the uh, of the game engine whatever they're using and the key element here is that the surface that they're standing on is reflective and then there's a light a lot of it is being carried by the lighting but in terms of the actual geometry of the 3D, it's actually quite simple. Now, I decided to also take a look at Goras, as you can see, common. Um, we have the three screens, one giant screen here in the middle, two mirrored screens here, some little props in her trident, a rather simple stage. Look at the decorations. Those are all very simple illustrations that glow. So is Kiara's. With hers, you can really see that the lighting is what's carrying it. These are all very simple, basic, you know, cubes with just nice lighting on it. And the most complicated pieces here are the uh, the sword and the shield. Now, the quintessential thing when I was coming up with um, the stage for Sana was the idea of well, the with Gura and Kiara, they had some of their elements here that showed them, hey. This is what they're all about. Whereas here, this is kind of like the idle stage that everyone uses. So when I was coming up with my concept here, I had to ask myself the question, well, when we look at Sana's art, oh, that is a bright, <laughs> that is bright one. But what makes Sana Sana? What are her trademarks? What makes her tick? And um, just the what are her memes? What are the memes related to her? So of course, the limiter. The limiter up here, the Atagarasu, the uh, Dango twin tails, the hairpins, 
And while this doesn't usually come up a lot, because of course when they're streaming, you only see it chest up pretty much. But this little dream catcher prop thing around her, um, around the stomach area, has always been always stood out to me as a very interesting design element. And I wanted to make use of that as well, even though it's one of the less pronounced things about her design. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I decided, okay, so uh, when we go back to my concept here, uh, this is going to be the metal ring that Yatagarasu uses. It's going to be at the back. We'll have the stage props be the dango hairpins. We'll have the dream catcher here and a limiter on top of the screen. And then we'll have the three screen format as well. Put lights on, this, on the stage itself, uh, lights on the metal ring, some spotlights, that kind of thing. And here it's just me being a little bit OC. I'm just jotting down all of the things that I want to include. And this is nice to have in the concept. And then as you go move on to blocking out in 3D, you get to realize the scope and limitations of your project. And it's that depending on how much time you have, like how is it, is it actually feasible to create all of the things that I want in time? Because in, uh, you know, what one of the things we say is that done is better than perfect. So let's now go to Blender. This is the, the 3D program that I use because it's open source. Um, we have the blocking out and 3D modeling. Now, in our case here, when I say blocking out in 3D, this is when you just use very simple shapes to jot down the placements of things that you want. So I just got a half of a sphere here. You know, the big rectangle for the idol stage, some cylinders, uh, blocks for the stairs. And the funny thing is the only real modeling I had to do was the this pin thing for the for the metal ring. And then I reused that and made the stuff for the dream catcher right over here. Get rid of this. Now, when I say blocking out versus 3D modeling, um, when we get to the actual 3D modeling, that's when we go into more detail, like the spiral over here. Now, because it's an idle stage, and remember what I was just saying earlier, um, a lot of this stuff, let me show you the most recent version of this. So let's load up stage three. I like to work in increments in case anything happens. Because um, with 3D programs, you, you'll never know what will happen. You'll never know when it'll crash. And um, if you lose your data, you're going to cry. <laughs> but you see, in terms of modeling, uh, let me remove that mixture for now. In terms of 3D modeling, the old, you'll notice that all I really modeled more was this hairpiece to serve as a good stage prop. And then our, uh, our little satellites, the, the bread dogs, you know? But even then, they're very, very simple models. They are just nice curves. Um, and you see, they're not very, very detailed. But what matters very much here is the silhouette. That's what really matters most here. Especially when you're working on um, in a low polygon count um, scene. Usually, um, silhouette is king. The, um, you don't really have to create anything overly overly um, complicated. And even as you saw from our references, idle stages are not overly complex. They're just filled with elements that will um, fulfill a lot of representations of the people or the talents that, uh, they, that they represent. So for Sana, like I said, the dango, the hair, the dream catchers, metal rings, and then so here we go. So essentially, after I did the blocking out, 3D modeling is just a little bit more detailed. But like I said, for this case, not really going into too much detail. Now, number five, step five is UV unwrapping and text, and then number six is texturing. Those go hand in hand. Now, if you're not familiar with the 3D pipeline, UV unwrapping is going to be the um, the toughest, usually most complicated concept that is taught to people who are 
new to the whole 3D thing. The best way I can explain it here, let me turn on those test textures that I had earlier. And we're going to now open the UV editor. Now, why is it called the UV editor? It's not actually an abbreviation. It's really just more because um, you'll see the lines here. You'll see X, Y, and Z. So this is the X, this is Y, and then Z is your height. And then if you just work backwards from the alphabet, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. So they just work three letters um, back. And when you see this flat grid here, this is U and this is the V. Essentially just a flat uh, grid. Now what happens here is we have a bit of a quirk when it comes to when it comes to 3D modeling. You will have a 3D prop, yes, but you texture it in 2D. The best way I can explain it is like when you have something like this. Oh, the nice old box of uh, fruity pebbles. I know it's mirrored <laughs> for the sake of the video. But essentially, um, this is a full 3D object. But what you want to do is to cut it open and flatten it out. So what I did was I opened the box in all sides. I cut, I cut the seam right here and I opened it out. So it's open flat like this. And then when you look behind, you see this is where all the good stuff happens. You can see it's literally unfolded. It's a 3D object that is now unfolded into a full 2D plane. And this is the exact same um, concept that we are using for the UVs here. So each of these faces corresponds to a different side of the, um, of the cube, of the object. Now, of course, UVing gets a little bit more complex when it comes to, of course, more complicated objects. For example, um, with bread dog over here with the sunlight. But for now, you might also be asking, well, Sen, what's up with this weird um, S circle texture you have going on here? Well, for that, that is just a, a test texture that I like to put on my objects in order to see how well my textures are going to appear. Ideally, you're going to want to have nearly perfect circles. Because when you scale this up or down, notice what happens. You see the circles are now starting to look more like oblongs. And that's not what you want. When you see that, that means the texture you're going to place on here is going to have distortion. So what you want to do, let's undo that. You're going to want to have these circles. And it tells you that your UV distribution is, um, is sound. Like I said, this is a very complex, it is one of the most complicated parts of the whole process. So if you'd like to talk more in depth about this, like I said, just hit me up on the Discord. Now, for our next, uh, for our next uh, demonstration, let me just open this up. Let's go and uh, look at the, the sunlight. Open that up. Okay. So with the sunlight, it's a bit of a different case. For this one, it's like a box, right? For the sunlight, what I did was, you're going to see here, this part, I decided to cut the, um, the, the main faces here. You see where those red lines are? Those are where I cut the seams. So essentially, it's this part that I ripped off. This here, this cut, that's the red that you're seeing. Now, if we turn this into a cylinder, we turn this into a cylinder just for um, demonstration purposes. So what I did essentially was, this is, imagine this is the sunlight, no? And the, the cover here is folded in. These are the caps on the cylinder. I decided to um, cut that and separate it out. And then so did I, so for the other side as well. Cut that part out and then you separate it, as you can see up there. So now what happens is you have this, hello chat, you have this open roll, pretty much, it's hollow now. So all you need to tell the program is, hey, I want to make a cut along here, and then I want you to unfold. 
So essentially, it goes like that, and then you unfold it. That's why there's that big rectangular shape that you're seeing going up and down. That's the rest of the body that's being unfolded. And then we're going to save this out, bring it into your uh, favorite vi uh, uh, photo editing program. My preference is um, Photoshop because that's my that's what I'm most familiar with. So, like I said, we're at now UV run wrapping, and we're going into texturing number six. So we'll open up Photoshop file. I already have good old um, the sunlight, the little bread dog loaded up here. And what you're gonna have is this this grid. You're gonna see essentially exactly what we put out here getting transported into Photoshop as a shaded layer where all the lines are listed. You're just going to have to remember what face corresponds to what, unfortunately. But it's just it's just a quirk of the system. It's just the way it is, and there's nothing we can do about it. So the first thing I like to do is to create a selection layer where I just you know select the uh, transparent background part. You just invert your selection and then fill it in with a um, solid color. When you do that solid color, you can just unselect that. You can always control click on it, and it'll select the whole thing. Makes just it just makes your life very easy. Okay, now the way I did this, I still have this all up. You start off with a base color. That's going to be the color of bread, and then of course I want to add a color here. That's lighter, or that the face of bread, right? And then layer three, I add the little browning on the sides. Then you add the face. <laughs> Cute little guy. I just take, took this reference from Sana's uh, merchandise. Add the little tongue. <laughs> Now, normally you would want to be working in late named layers, especially if you're in a team. But for the sake of my personal project, I know what all the layers mean, even if they're just numbers like this. In a professional setting, you're going to want to have to label them properly so that whoever is going to work on it next will understand exactly what layer corresponds to what. And then when you're exporting this out, you're going to want to remove the wireframes. This was just serving as a guide, but when you're done with it, you have to remove the wireframes. Otherwise, the, all these wireframes are gonna get included in your textures. So be sure to um, get rid of those, and then you export this as a PNG, normally a PNG. PNG, Targa, just make sure it's a file that doesn't have a lot of compression. So JPEGs are a no-no. And then with that, let's, okay, let's go to exporting to Unity. We'll have do, the rest of this is uh, Unity. Okay, now the fun stuff, this is my personal favorite part, is when we finally get to um, Unity. Unity is my choice because it's a very lightweight game engine. Um, it doesn't take too, too many resources. Let's open it up right here. And here we are. This is where every all the magic happens. This is where it all comes together. Um, so our first step here is we were exporting to Unity. Now the beautiful thing about Blender is that Blender has integrations with Unity. So you can see we have our file up, file name up here, Sana Idle Stage Three dot Blend. That's a Blend file. Now the incredible thing is. You don't have to export these things one by one. No, 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 no. The great thing is you can literally just drag and drop your Blender file into Unity and you'll see it appear right there. See? Sana Idle Stage number three. And you just literally drag and drop it. And it, it, there it is. There it is. Let me just zero out the positioning here so that you will we can see it more properly and then let's rotate this about 180 degrees go so that's how it happened okay i'm just going to show you how i did this let's make a parallel 
structure like that. There you go. Move it here. So you remember, you already remember, that's exactly, this is how, exactly how it looked like in um, Blender. You just remove that uh, little light source here because we do not need that. Prefab. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Essentially, when we have this, this is a prefab. This is all packaged. So you need to right-click um, prefab, and then you unpack it. So now you can make edits to the individual individual pieces. Now on me, that was on me for Blender. I should have gotten rid of the of the light before I uh, exported it, but so be it. It was easy enough to edit. Now, as you can see, these are all grayed out. These are ex this is exactly how it looks like from the Blender file. And uh, you might be asking now, well, Sin, you exported it to Unity. And also, how come there are two textures on the, uh, why are there some pinks mixed in with the grays? Now, the reason for that is because I want to have this single object to have two different types of textures on it. So the way we do it is, I go here to this materials folder. I created this. So you're going to see quite a few different materials. And you're going to see some textures here, like bread dog. So for example, um, with bread dog, I create a new material. Just right click in this editor. You create a new material. And then for our sake, I named it bread dog. This is the thing that I created. And the only thing I changed was this base map, this thing. This is the texture we had from Photoshop right earlier. And you just literally drag and drop that into the base map to tell Unity that, hey, this is the texture that I want you to use. Okay? Now, you know, this material goes on bread dog. So you literally just drag and drop these onto the bread dogs. That simple. And then for the glowing, for the glow sticks, I created here, this is an emissive map. Now an emissive map is usually just a glowing color. See here, you, emission, you just check that, emission map. And then when you put it on the texture, see it glows. Now that doesn't actually um, contribute to the lighting of your, um, of your scene. It just is a glowing uh, texture. So essentially, I just create more materials, keep dragging and dropping them. And this is the final product that we ended up with. Now, how did I create the reflective material? Now, that is something special here with the, this uh, black metal that I created. This one makes use of metallic texture. This is why I wanted to work with Unity, because it's very intuitive, very easy to do it here. So all you do is take this metallic map, and this is essentially just a one or a zero, pretty much. You don't normally just put this in the middle. I mean, you can if you really wanted to. But for me personally, the way I do it is, is, the, is this material metallic? Yes or no? If it's yes, put it to one. If it's no, put it to zero. So I said, hey, let's make this a metallic reflective material. That's how you're getting this lovely little sheen on here too. So metallic map one, and then smoothness right under it. This is also another parameter that you have to tweak. Essentially, it goes from zero is matte, and one is reflective. So as you can see here, does not reflect at all. It's a, it's a matte metal. Then you can turn it up slowly, as you can see, starting to pick up the color. As you really turn it up, it's gonna start picking up more lighting details. Then you turn it all the way up. It's now fully reflective. That's all it takes to make it reflective. And this is probably the technique they've also used when making 3D stages in uh, Hololive. Uh, another interesting thing here is, you know, I just created these little textures, just put them up, made them, you know, put them into materials, and I just dragged and dropped constantly. And when once that's done, you have this. Let me just get rid of the, uh, the old um, copy here. 
because we no longer need that. That was just for demonstration purposes. Uh, okay, let me just get rid of that. Okay. So now you have the scene ready. Here we go on our list. Lighting, setting the scene, taking screenshots. For lighting, the main thing you need to take a look at is this directional light. This essentially acts as the sun. What you need to do here, the position doesn't matter. What matters is the angle. So when you change this, you see it turning. You see it also affecting the lighting of the stage. See? See that? The shadows are moving. So you just need to find the best angle that works for your, um, for your scene. For me, I decided to make it uh, coming down from the upper left. That's why there's that nice reflective uh, sheen on the metallic pin on the metal circle. Then once you're set up with that, once you're happy with the lighting, all you need to do is take your camera. And now you're going to see this little picture here, the main camera. This is what the, cap what the camera sees. You're now setting up the scene. So now you just adjust your camera. It's sensitive to positioning. It, you can angle it in whatever way you want. There are multiple options that uh, you can check out. We won't go into detail. If you guys want to uh, know more, just let me know. Um, and then once that's done, you are now going to take your screenshots. Now, you don't just take screenshots from here. You, you can open your game camera here and it'll look like that. But sometimes it's like if you just take a screenshot and then crop that out, the resolution's kind of messed up. So what I do, what I did was to install this thing called a unit, the Unity Recorder. So you go into Window, General, um, Recorder, and Recorder Window. So this little thing opens here. This is the Unity Recorder. So there are multiple options that you can do here, but all you need to know with the way I set this up is that I'm just telling it to take a picture of what's in the main camera and then give it to me as a PNG file right here. So once you press play, it will take a picture, put the screenshot into a designated folder uh, of your choosing, and then that's the art that I decided to upload to Twitter and on uh, and on our Discord. That's that's how I did this. So that is our process. That is how I personally create a 3D scene. So the most important thing I would say, the most important thing is really to solidify and create a concept and have solid references. Because the moment you get stuck, you could always go back to your reference and you'll always find a way to, uh, there might be something you missed, something you can integrate more and remember we're just taking references we're not plagiarizing anything that is an absolute no no <laughs> we're just taking references we're making sure like okay what are the essential elements that make this thing what it is that's really the key in looking for references lock it on in 3d then you start de make detailed modeling uv unwrap it for the texturing Bring the textures into Photoshop, make your textures, export everything into Unity, adjust your lighting, set your scene, set the cameras, take your screenshots, and you're good to go. Now, like I said, this is a very simple way of doing things. So if you guys are more interested in going into more depth, into how I did more modeling stuff, how I did the UVing, um, like I said, multiple times already, just Hit me up on the Discord, link is in the description below. And with that, I would say our session is adjourned. Everybody, please take care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next one. This is Senator Warchief, signing out. Otsu sent.